Nigeria suffers a variety of complex political problems, including inequality, corruption, oil disputes, national disunity, and the Boko Haram insurgency. This seven year conflict and humanitarian crisis in the north has killed 20,000 and displaced 2.6 million people. Despite the government's announcement in 2016 that the group had been crushed, attacks have continued throughout 2017 from Madugori City to the Lake Chad Basin in IDP camps, universities, and mosques. The plight of refugees fleeing the violence is also worsening with the current severe drought and impending famine across northeast Nigeria. Violence has also intensified in rural areas between Fulani housemen and farmers amid claims of trespassing and sabotage. This cycle of violence is also catalyzed by the drought. The Niger Delta has also been the scene of serious violence. Between 2006 and 2009, a militant group named MEND protested against the poverty of the region despite the oil wealth it produced. In 2009, a general amnesty was accepted by these militants. However, in 2016, President Buhari's 70% cut to the amnesty program prompted further unrest. Since 2016, attacks have largely been carried out by the NDA, targeting major pipelines and provoking huge economic consequences. Another element in Nigeria's political status quo is the legacy of the Biafran Civil War. 1967 to 1970, which saw the defeat of Biafran separatists by federal forces and the death of a million people. Grievances in the Igbo community were ignited in 2015 in protest by Igbo youth. The Nigerian government has since been accused of using excessive force, killing 115 protesters from August 2015 to 2016. Nigeria is a country of diverse cultures, religions, and traditions with over 250 ethnic groups. Over the years, Nigerians have encountered a phenomenon known as ethnic inequality. The Nigerian ethnic groups are divided into Hausa and the Fulani, 29% of the population, Yoruba, 31%. Igbo or Igbo, 18%, Ijo, 10%, Kanuru, 4%, Ibibio, 3.5%, and Tiv, 2.5%. In the early 70s and 80s, a certain ethnic group, the Hausa, became the favored group over others. There are three major ethnic groups in Nigeria, namely Hausa, Igbo, and Yoruba. When it comes to hiring an individual for a position in a company, the preferred candidate will usually come from the northern region and be from the Hausa. From the early 2000s, the situation seems to have become worse. Perhaps it is attributable to the shift in government administrations. During the good luck Jonathan regime, the eastern part of Nigeria had upper hand for job and contract opportunities. Half of Jonathan's cabinet members were from the East. 
The current regime is focused on the Northerners. In 2012, Nigeria was estimated to have lost over $400 billion to corruption since independence. In 2018, the country ranked 144th in the 180 countries listed in Transparency International's Corruption Index, with Somalia at 180, be the most corrupt, and Denmark the least. Nigerian politicians find themselves in a strong position of power and wealth due to their connections with oil and gas industries in Nigeria. These gas industries are under the control of the state-owned Nigerian National Petroleum Company, NNPC. Oil and gas exports account for over 90% of all Nigerian export revenues. While many politicians own or have shares in these industries, tax revenues from the energy sector are diminished and the benefits of Nigerians energy wealth is not evenly distributed throughout the country with Lagos State benefiting disproportionately. Oil and gas revenue therefore account for the vast majority of the federal budget and the salaries of government officials. As a multi-ethnic, multilingual, and multicultural society, the Niger Delta comprises over 20 different ethnic and sub-ethnic groups, many of whom trace their origins to the Yoruba, Igbo, Edo, and Ijo. It is these groups, together with the Delta Cross, that constitute the five major linguistic and cultural groups in the region. Based on the 2005 census, the population of the people in the Niger Delta is over 30 million. Among the ethnic groups in the region, the Ijo, who are distributed among six states of the Nigerian Federation, constitute the largest single ethnic group in the region and the fourth largest in the country. Given its natural location, multi-ethnic, multilingual, and multicultural character. The Niger Delta is no stranger to environmental conflicts. Conflict over the ownership and distribution of resources has been a defining feature of Niger Delta's economic history. Niger Delta society captures the violent dispute between two coastal communities over the ownership of fish ponds, similarly trade disputes over the control of trading posts and routes were not uncommon among the pre-colonial communities of the Niger Delta. However, the presence of oil companies in the Niger Delta over the last 50 years has not only altered the nature and dynamics of environmental conflicts in the region, but also exacerbated them in ways that have defied a lasting solution. Oil and gas development has led to the intensification of conflict in the Niger Delta and the growth of environmental concerns, both of which are inextricably linked to the politics of resource ownership. Its mode of appropriation and use. In other words, conflicts over oil barren 
environment are directly linked to the social relations that underpin the exploration and production of oil and gas in this volatile region. The first level of conflict over the environment is that between oil companies and the oil producing communities and centers on corporate neglect, environmental de degradation and disruption of social and economic life, lack of developmental projects and violation of human rights, compensation, and employment opportunities and contracts, amongst others. According to a share commission study, land acquisition, oil spill compensation, hiring and contracting are aspects of share, and by extension, other oil companies' policies that can feed into or even create conflict. The task of unifying the various ethnic, religious, political, and socio-economic groupings in Nigeria has remained a doughty national challenge more than 100 years after amalgamation in 1914. This is particularly puzzling considering that all government regimes since independence in 1960 have made national unity their important agenda. Concomitant programs, policies, and matras include institutionalization of the federal character principle, the National Youth Service Corps (NYSC), unity schools, national symbols, national rotation agency (NOA), and mantras such as the unity of the nation is not negotiable. Among others, have been adopted to facilitate national unity in Nigeria. Yet the gap between the various groupings seems wider as the nation is still plugged with ethnic rivalry, religious intolerance, political exclusion, quest for self-determination, power sharing and violent agitations, to mention a few. The challenges to national unity in Nigeria appear to persist because of the manipulations of political, ethnic, and religious elites due to peculiar gains and enduring rivalry over the control of state power. The results show that unity remains a scarce commodity in Nigeria because of the manner elites conceived results, government policies, and projects are narrowly conceived and implemented to favor selected groups and communities. This heightens disagreements and controversies among the diverse peoples and communities threatening the nation's existence and development. Nigeria's ongoing battle with insurgent groups and continued government corruption threatened the stability and political integrity of Africa's most popular states. Since 2011, Boko Haram, one of the largest Islamist militant groups in Africa, has conducted terrorist attacks on religious and political groups, local police, and the military, as well as discriminately attacking civilians in busy markets and villages. The kidnapping of over 200 girls from their school in April 2014 drew international attention to the ongoing threat from Boko Haram and the government's inability to contain it.
President Muhammadu Buhari, the former military dictator who defeated incumbent Goodluck Jonathan, was elected in 2015 on a counter-terrorism platform. But economic and political challenges in Nigeria have complicated the fight against Boko Haram. In addition to the military conflict, continue on evil distribution of oil revenue, high levels of corruption, and violence in the Middle Belt region pose significant challenges to Nigeria security. Links between Boko Haram and other Islamist groups could further intensify regional security concerns. After the group pledged allegiance to the Islamic State in March 2015, the United States boosted its military assistance and deployed 300 troops to Nigeria in an effort to help in the fight against Boko Haram. As the largest African oil producer, the stability of Nigeria is important to regional security and U.S. economic interests. Violence has also intensified in rural areas between Fulani husbandmen and farmers amid claims of trespassing and sabotage. This circle of violence is also catalyzed by the drought. These uh, Fulani husbandmen, they are disturbing our people this, along this road. You know, this is a federal highway and they have been tormenting people, robbing, raping women, doing all sorts of bad things even to the state that has extended their movement to inside the villages and kill people there. Violent conflicts between nomadic herders from northern Nigeria and sedentary agrarian communities in the central and southern zones have escalated in recent years and are spreading southward, threatening the country's security and stability. Implemented and executed to the latter. That is why people will be dying, about 300, 400 people will die all across Nigeria within four months, January to April. With an estimated death toll of approximately 2,500 people in 2016, these clashes are becoming as potentially dangerous as the Boko Haram insurgency in the Northeast. Response to the crisis at both the federal and state levels has been poor. Familiar problems relating to land and water use, obstruction of traditional migration routes, livestock theft, and crop damage tend to trigger these disputes. But their roots run deeper. Drought and desertification have degraded pastures, dried up many natural water sources across Nigeria's far northern Sahara Belt and forced large numbers of herders to migrate south in search of grassland and water for their herds. Insecurity in many northern states, a consequence of the Boko Haram insurgency in the northeast and less of well-reported rural banditry and cattle rustlings in the northwest and north central zones also prompt increasing numbers of husbandmen to migrate south. The growth of human settlements, expansion of public infrastructure, and acquisition of land by large-scale farmers and other private commercial interests have deprived herders of grazing reserves designated by the post-independence government of the former northern region now split into 19 states. Herders migrating into the savannah and rainforest of the central and southern states are moving into regions where high population growth over the last four decades has heightened pressure on farmland, increasing the frequency of disputes over crop damage, 
water pollution and cattle theft. In the absence of mutual accepted mediation mechanism, this disagreement increasingly turned violent. The spread of conflict into certain states is aggravating already fragile relations among the country's major regional, ethnic and religious groups. The South's majority Christian communities resent the influx of predominantly Muslim herders, portrayed in some narratives as an Islamization force. Others are mostly Fulani, leading an ethnic dimension to strife. In so far as the Fulani spread across many West and Central African countries, any major confrontation between them and other Nigerian groups could have regional repercussions, drawing in fighters from neighboring countries. As these conflicts increase in frequency, intensity and geographical scope, so does their humanitarian and economic toll. The increasing availability of illicit firearms, both locally produced and smuggled in from outside, worsens the bloodshed. Over the past five years, thousands have been killed. Precise tallies are unavailable, but a survey of open source reports suggests fatalities may have reached an annual average of more than 2,000 from 2011 to 2016, for some years exceeding the toll from the Boko Haram insurgency. Tens of thousands have been forcibly displaced, with properties, crops and livestock worth billions of naira destroyed, at great cost to local and state economies. The reaction from Nigeria's federal and state authorities so far has been wanting. Aside from the recent push against Boko Haram and military operations against cattle rustlings, they have done little else to address rural insecurity in the north. Federal security and law enforcement agencies have established neither early warning nor rapid response mechanisms. They have not arrested and prosecuted perpetrators of violence or offered redress to victims. Until recently, Officials have paid little, if any, attention to improving livestock management practices to minimize friction with agrarian communities. State governments' responses overall have been short-sighted. Most have failed to encourage community-level dialogue. As a result, both herders and farmers are taking matters into their own hands further aggravating conflicts. President Buhari's government, which is increasingly viewed with misgivings by many in central and southern states, should make it a priority to take firm and transparent steps to ensure better protection for both herders and farmers. Affected state governments also should better coordinate with federal authorities to reduce risks of violence. The federal government's failure to define a clear and coherent political approach to resolving the crisis, or even acknowledge its scope, is putting Nigerian citizens at risk. Over the years, dozens of Nigerians were killed over the course of several days. 
On July 19, 20, attacks were made by radical Muslims of Fulani ethnicity in Sata Kaduna. A few days later, the attacks repeated. This time targeted the small village of Zikpak, which is mainly comprised of minority Christian school. The attacks are part of a larger scheme ongoing since January 2020, which has involved the murder, rape, looting, adoption, and forced displacement of non-Muslims. Although Nigeria President Muhammad Buhari has imposed a curfew in an attempt to protect the minority groups, this has actually made it easier for the Fulani militia to target them. The recent spark in violence against non-Muslims in Kaduna is part of a larger conflict that has lasted since at least the 1980s and has claimed nearly 20,000 lives. Nigerian non-Muslims, most of whom identify as Christians, have experienced not only physical violence but, but systematic violence. The large economic disparity between the two groups favors Fulani Muslims. In addition, non-Muslims have been excluded from positions of office, which has inhabited the ability to fight back against injustice. In 2000, the governor of Kaduna State, Sharia law, that is religious law from the Islamic tradition, to the state, this suited non-Muslim groups even further. You could imagine an attack that security men were around and they have to run for their life. What more of civilians? So it was horrible. Even though many Nigerians have criticized their government for refusing to take action with regard to this issue, the government has thus far failed to create an effective plan. The failure or unwillingness of those in authority to address this and other non-state actors and to secure ungoverned spaces has not only allowed the violence to mutate but has also created an environment in which Boko Haram can extend its operations. The killing of innocent minority groups is a form of genocide and one that cannot be allowed. The Nigerian government must step up and take further steps to protect Christian groups in Kaduna or other parts of the country. One significant step the government could take is restricting armaments in Nigeria. As of now, the Fulani majority has unrestricted access to weapons which they can use freely against non-Muslims. Gun laws would make it more difficult for these weapons to be bought and would therefore create a safer environment. However, this ethnic issue is deeply ingrained in Nigerian politics and economics. It may be best for the United Nations to interfere on behalf of the terrorized minority groups. Though the UN has been hesitant to intervene in third world genocides in the past. This issue cannot be ignored. The UN must put aside its first world bars and work to protect these Christian groups. As a developing nation, Nigeria is often ignored by developed countries, especially with the coronavirus absorbing much of our headspace. It is easy to forget about issues that are not a personal threat. As dominant members of the United Nations, developed countries need to reflect on those issues outside of themselves. Violence against non-Muslims in Nigeria is only increasing and waiting to take action might result in the complete elimination of these groups. 
Christian Nigerians have already faced almost four decades of turbulence based solely on their ethnicity and religious affiliation, allowing them to experience any more violence and allow Nigeria to slip into political instability is not an option. I believe that if he rises up, these people will stop. Who are these people? Can they face Buhari? They can't. Buhari should just stand up and, and speak to them. We don't carry arms. We will not carry arms. We don't teach carrying arms. But we can call on God. Our God is bigger than human ammunition. I've always prayed that God in his infinite power will be able to stop this unwanted killing that's been going on in Nigeria, be it as a result of religious, communal, political, ritual, whatsoever kind of killing.